What is up, everybody? Welcome, welcome, welcome to the live stream. It's so good to be back with you on a Monday evening uh, after our little Sunday. Oh, well, some would call it a some would call it a vacation. It wasn't really. It was a vacation for my wife. Uh, she went kayaking and saw the Sandhill Cranes. She said, I'm going to be gone all day. Is that a problem? And I said, as any good husband would, I said, nope, no problem at all. I can definitely reschedule my live stream. Uh, and that's what I did. So uh, in case you were wondering what kind of fun I was getting up to, it was uh, watching my sons, uh, hanging out with my sons, however you want to put it. Um, <clears throat> well, my wife went off and had fun kayaking on a river, on a lake all day. Uh, by the way, in case you noticed that there is a stream scheduled for this Wednesday, that's why, uh, my, I, I felt like doing a makeup stream, mostly Blunty. I felt like doing a makeup stream for you, <laughs> to be honest with you. Yeah. For the clips channel, right? Yeah. So we can make sure we get that clip channel in there. Yep. Well, uh, the live stream clips channel needs content for my live streams. So you can't have live stream clips without live streams. And, um, I'm just like, okay, well, we'll do a little makeup stream. So if you, uh, it, it is, by the way, I originally scheduled it for 8 p.m. because it's a weekday. And I was like, okay, we'll schedule it for the evening. And then Ghost Branch pointed out uh, he's in Cologne, Germany, if I, my memory is correct. He was like, well, if it's a European stream, shouldn't it be in the afternoon so that it's in our evening? Because we're the ones who missed the stream. And I was like, oh, good point. So I've rescheduled it for the afternoon. It'll be 2 p.m. this Wednesday. Uh, a little makeup stream for the Europeans or uh, the Americans can tune in too, but it'll be during your work day. Those of you who work, who aren't just FPV bums and losers. Mm. Um, but uh, tonight, tonight it's just you and me. It's just us. You, me, and a nice glass of, uh, there's probably a name for this cocktail. It's Drambuie and Glenlivet. Uh, thank you to Eirik Toft. Uh, who sent me a bottle of Drambuie and a bottle of Glenlivet probably round about last January, I would guess. It was either Christmas or birthday. Maybe it wasn't. And uh, it's a very nice little cocktail. If that has a name, you let me know in the chat. And if I see un if I seem unusually uh, joyous tonight, that's why. It's alcohol. <laughs> oh, <clears throat> All right, here's what we got going on. Here's what we're doing. Bastian Sonderman, good to see you. I haven't seen that name in a long time. Um, here's what we got going on. I got uh, got your comments here. I got your comments here. I'm going to be taking your questions. That's what we do. I, I save a, myself the trouble of figuring out what you'll find interesting by getting you to tell me what you think is interesting. Ask me questions. It's Blunty. He's going to queue them up. We got the queue. There's barely any in the queue. Blunty, why are there so few questions in the queue? Nobody's asking anything. There's They're just like, like two questions just barely came in now. I mean, there's not, nobody's asking anything. Everybody okay. doesn't understand the secret of your stream. <laughs> the people want to get questions answered, right? They want all this. They, they, we get questions. We have 30 questions by the end of the stream. We can't all get to them. But mm -hmm. the, the secret is if you get in right at the time we start the stream up, that means the queue started up, but nobody's asked any questions. So if you ask yeah. a question at that time, there's like a 95% chance you're going to answer it. That's Unless a it's a lame question that I don't like and choose to ignore. That's correct. That's what, that part should have gone unsaid. But like I said, <laughs> <laughs> that's where we're at. That's where we're at today, boys. <laughs> um, <clears throat> okay, so you, you can ask questions. Blunty's going to queue them up. I'm going to answer them. That's what we're going to do for about two hours. Uh, I got to take a minute here at the beginning of the stream and say thank you to these folks on the right side of my screen. This is my Discord server, and these folks are my patrons, and they get special access to the right hand side of my screen, but the center of my heart. Thank you guys for your support, and we will be definitely. Uh, there are no questions queued up from patrons. Like, I'd love to give you guys preferential treatment for being patrons, but uh, you, you're not asking them. Okay. Uh, and last but not least, if you want to make sure I re get your question, hit the dollar sign down here at the bottom and leave a super chat. I will begin reading the super chats. I usually just let them let them stack up a little, take some questions from the from the normal people, from the plebs who don't put any filthy money 
up for their, me to read their questions. And then we'll get to the Super Chats, uh, you know, in 10 or 15 minutes or so. We'll start reading them. Uh, great. Questions are coming in. Let's go. Let's go. Uh, I do. I am actually going to start with this Super Chat from Tyler Volker. Um, this question came in before the comment queue got started, and so I don't want to lose it. So, uh, Tyler Volker, thank you for a $5 super chat. Tyler says, your thoughts on the HD0 Freestyle VTX Crux 35 or building a Flywoo Crab 3.6? Have you seen it? Can I even build one for the price HD0 is offering? So, um, let's just pull up on screen the drones that you are asking about. The first one is the Crux 35 with HD zero. Um, so let me start by saying the HD zero crux or the, uh, the happy model crux three, five is a really good little three inch. Actually, I think it's three and a half inch, a really good little three and a half inch ripper. You know, obviously nothing is perfect, but this is way above average in this class. And I, I highly, everybody I know who has one is pretty much happy with it. And I highly recommend it if you're interested in something in this size. Okay. So, you know, that aside, what about the HD zero? It's cool that they're selling an HD zero version, right? How many HD zero bind and flies are there? Not a, not a huge number. So great that HD zero fans, HD zero customers, users who want to get a bind and fly have the option to get the Crux 35. But the question is, the question is, I want to build a Flywoo Crab 3.6. So the Flywoo Crab is a frame. It's a 220 millimeter frame kit from Flywoo. And you want to build it yourself. And I would say, let, 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 let's find somebody selling the Crux 3.5. Who's selling it? No, oh, they're selling it on the HD Zero website. That's actually kind of amazing. Uh, oh, they're selling it with the freaking Freestyle VTX even better. Wow. That's really cool. That's really cool. That's great. Um, 250 bucks. Uh, in general, you're going to struggle to build a bind and fly as cheap as a manufacturer can build it. And I know this is backwards because like, Normally, if you build something yourself, like you buy Ikea furniture, you build it yourself, you get a discount for the labor, right? But in the case of bind and flies, they can churn these things off the assembly line. Just they could churn them off the assembly line so much more efficiently and they buy the parts in bulk. So they get the parts. They're getting a discount on the parts. The assembly isn't actually that expensive. A lot of times these bind and flies are less ex like it's like asking the question uh if you were to b b make your own camera like literally you're going to make a digital camera yourself you're not going to make it as cheap as sony because they buy a million sensors and a million circuit boards and you're going to buy one right that's the analogy that's not a great analogy but it'll do so like you're going to pay what's the hd0 what's the hd0 freestyle v2 come for 150 bucks, 150 bucks for the VTX, 50 bucks for the frame. You're already at 200 bucks. You don't have a flight controller, ESC or motors yet. There is no way. There's no world like the absolute minimum that you're going to build this flywoo crab is going to be 300. Let's say maybe 350. So you have to really want this frame. Now, there's nothing wrong with this frame. Maybe it's a very good frame, but you're going to pay a real premium for getting it. And frankly, here's the thing. Here's the little secret. Here's the little secret. Hang on. We'll go to the up close camera. If you love that frame, chat, do you see where I'm going? Buy the Crux 3.5, spend $50 more on the Flywoo frame. And then rip the guts out of the Crux 3.5. Actually, don't even do that. Enjoy the Crux 3.5 until you break an arm, which, you know, statistically you will eventually. And then just swap over to the Flywoo frame. Right? Yeah. That's the way to do it. Okay. Mm. 
Hmm. It's nice. The uh, Dram... I'm told that it's Dramboy, not Drambui. I'm told that it's Dramboy. Fine. The Dramboy, the honey at Dramboy really takes the sort of uh, harshness of the... Not that Glenlivet's very harsh, but it really softens it. It's very, very nice. Little cocktail. Okay, continuing. Continuing with our questions. Um, excuse me. Just spitting on camera. Pardon me. Tommy B, I'm having troubles flashing my boxer. Tried USB and Wi-Fi flashing. I'm getting an error every time. Tommy, what error are you getting? If you're getting an error on Wi-Fi flashing, see, here's the thing. I heartily agree that you should use the Wi-Fi flashing, okay? But if you're getting an error on Wi-Fi flashing, there's very few places that that can, like, go wrong. USB flashing, you can have driver problems, you have all kinds of freaking problems. And I, 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 even me, who's like, oh, I'm some tech guru, I can do anything, I'm just like, F it. I'm not, I'm not dealing with it. And I do Wi-Fi flashing almost all the time. What error are you getting? I don't know. Uh, Tommy B, I actually uh, didn't see your original question. Didn't mention that uh, you you were getting an error. So tell me what the error is, and we'll we'll consider coming back to the question. Um, keep an eye on the chat, Blunty, if you would, if they get a message from Tommy B. Um. Is there a way to keep the Cadix Polar Vista recording beyond disarm? Yes. Um, there is a setting that automatically starts recording when you arm, and if you enable that setting, it also stops recording when you disarm. Personally, I would love to have a setting that starts recording when you arm and then keeps recording when you disarm, right? Because I hate it when I forget to start recording, but I almost always would rather have the recording at the end. I can't remember exactly where in the menus that setting is because I've been using the goggles too for a little while and I haven't been using the V2 goggles as often. So I can't tell you exactly where it is. There is a setting in the menu. It's like the auto start recording setting. Anybody in the chat remember where in the menu that is? That's the setting. You need to turn that off. So that, But then you have to manually start recording. Wow, Michael Holt. Great question from Michael Holt. I'm building your five inch DIY FPV drone. First of all, excellent taste in, in drones. Uh, my five inch DIY build kit, I'll just take the opportunity to plug it real quick. How could I not? Well, oftentimes I am actually terrible at marketing my own products, but um, here, it, here it is, it's back ordered. Damn. What about this one? What about the analog? The analog version is not back ordered. <laughs> uh, this kit comes with everything you need to build a five inch freestyle drone. Well, I mean, all the parts, not the tools. You have to buy the tools separately. And also, you know, you're going to need a battery. And okay, so not everything you need, but all the main parts to build an FPV freestyle drone. And I have a full build tutorial that takes you through every step of building it. It's the single best way to get into FPV, in my humble, humble opinion because it takes you through all the steps, the very first things you got to do, uh, and uh, hand holds you through them. It's really great. Um, but the question is, can I use a copper-plated Scotch-Brite pad? N n I think no, but I'm not sure. So what you don't want to do with a soldering iron is use any kind of abrasive cleaner. The tip of a soldering iron is like, it's. I, I think it's copper, but then it's copper tarnish is really bad, okay? And the oxidation, tarnishing is just oxidation. That oxide is actually really bad at transmitting heat. So an oxidized soldering iron tip is really bad at doing the one thing that soldering irons need to do. So what they do is they take the soldering iron tip and they coat it with a nickel alloy. And that nickel alloy is very, very thin. So if you've got a soldering iron tip and it's dirty and you take like a steel wool or sandpaper, God forbid, or a file and you, <laughs> you clean it off, you've destroyed it because you'll scrape off the nickel coating and now it's just unusable. Okay. 
So I don't know about copper-plated scotch bright. Like, copper's a relatively soft metal. Maybe it would be okay. But you want brass. So the sponges that people use to clean soldering irons are brass. And the brass is softer than the tip of the iron and will not damage it. I don't know about copper, but in general, I would shy away from anything except brass. Or if you don't have that, get a, get a towel or a paper towel and wet it and just use the wet towel or paper towel to clean it, to clean it off. I suggest a paper towel because you'll get little metal bits in it and you don't want to just throw that in the washer. You'll, 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 you'll like ruin a towel if you use like a cotton towel. Don't use a synthetic towel. It'll melt. So yeah, just get some paper towels, wet them thoroughly, and use that instead. Super Deluxe, great tip. Instead of a brass sponge, use gold. Use a gold sponge to clean your soldering iron tip. That's true. It, it's a soft metal. It's too expensive. Big Data Pimp says copper is softer than brass. Okay. I didn't know that. Maybe copper would be okay, but like whenever someone says I'm going to clean my soldering iron tip with something I'm like... Is there some other aspect of a scotch Brite pad that wouldn't be a good idea? Just use a paper towel if you're not sure. Um, okay. Ooh. Here's a question from King Keck. Thank you for a $5 super chat, King Keck. Main differences between ELRS 915 and Crossfire. If you were on TBS, would you switch? Basically looks like Crossfire to me is why I ask. Okay, now, there are a ton of videos. If I go, if I go over to Joshua Bardwell live stream clips, to the Joshua Bardwell live stream clips channel, and I, and I search for Crossfire, there are a million cases of, where people asked me about Crossfire versus Express LRS. And I basically stopped answering that question, but I am gonna answer this one. By the way, if you're not familiar with my live stream clips channel, now you are, and now you see like the one of the most useful parts of it is like, I remember Bardwell talked about this thing. Goat. How often did Bardwell talk about goats on his live stream? Well, more often, more effing often than you would think, apparently. You can just search for live stream clips. It's great. Or you could just find highlights uh, from my live streams if you want to go check that out. Definitely go check that out. 17,000 subscribers. We're doing okay, Plenty. We're climbing. We're climbing. It's yeah. getting there. The, am the amount of effort I had to put in for that lumpy video, I hope it was worth it. <laughs> I appreciate it. That I think that was hilarious. Why was it so much effort? Uh, I had to, I mean, the thumbnail took time to do. I haven't ever, you know, like, I just don't do any of this stuff ever. So, like, I had to, yeah, I don't know, pull the stuff out to get you cut out. And then I was fighting with you getting cut out. And then I had to put the text over. Then I had to, you know. And yeah. then after I did the stupid thumbnail, it normally takes two minutes for any other video. Mm. And I had to cut the video. And then I had to cut out the last part first and clip it out so it wasn't too long. And people wouldn't leave before we got to it. You know, it's a whole thing. So it just, like... For our workflow, it was sounds quite like, a lot more work. It sounds like you were asked to do like slightly more than the most basic editing tasks. I think what you're well, telling when, me is that usually when you, the amount of editing you put into this is extremely minimal. Yes, because that's what <laughs> makes the most sense from yeah. all the standpoints. Yeah, no, fair. Fair. I thought I thought there was I, – I, I was expecting more, I have to say. I was expecting more. Um, but I appreciate it. That, that bit cracks me the fuck up. And, uh, I actually was able to tease him about this. He posted a video in some, uh, some Facebook group and I was like, yeah, that's cool. But what about those goats? And he was like, God damn it, Bardwell. So it's totally worth it. To, uh, yeah. Just to not be too transparent here, but the, the reason that we spend 2.5 minutes on a thumbnail is not because we want to spend 2.5. It's because like, there's a, there's a numbers thing. You know what I mean? Yeah. Yeah. Like, I don't, people are like, if you need a thumbnail guy, like, that's not the problem, you know? What do you mean spend like, 2.5 minutes on a thumbnail? That we're talking about this thumbnail? Or it took you no, two and a half minutes to No, that's how long I thumbnail. spend on our thumbnails for, for, like, each thumbnail that I make on average. You know what oh, I mean? yeah, yeah, yeah. No, your thumbnails. But like, we can't afford to spend money on thumbnails. Like, it doesn't, right. there's no. 
Like no, it. the live stream clips channel. I mean, I'm hoping that eventually it will make more money. Like I'm hoping, obviously, I'd like to. I would like to make money, but right now it doesn't make a ton of money. Uh, it it doesn't, and uh, we have to like just crank them out, just to just to sort of not lose money on everyone. I, I honestly, there was a time when I was contemplating shutting the live stream clips channel down. To be honest with you, you know, I mean, you know that plenty. The guys don't know that. I don't know. Do you know that? <laughs> anyway, uh, let's get back to the question. The reason I'm going to answer this question is because this is not just asking Crossfire versus ELRS, but specifically 900 megahertz. See, usually the Crossfire versus ELRS question is 2.4 gigahertz ELRS versus 900 megahertz Crossfire, which should I get, right? And I've answered that ad nauseum. But Express ELRS has always had 900 megahertz gear, but it's got a resurgence lately. The Emacs Eris module. The Emacs Eris module. Eris Link Express LRS control system is a two watt 900, excuse me, two watt 900 megahertz control link. That didn't used to exist. And also Radio Master Bandit the Radio Master Bandit Express LRS module. That's another 900 megahertz module. So we've got mass produced 900 megahertz modules and receivers in a way that we didn't before. And that has led a whole bunch of people to wonder, should I switch from Crossfire? The main thing that you would make you switch away from Crossfire, Crossfire is fine, right? The main thing that would make you switch is, number one, Express LRS is less expensive. Express LRS modules are significantly less expensive than Crossfire modules. Express LRS receivers are significantly less expensive. Now, some would argue that the build quality of Crossfire is better and more reliable. I think that depends on who you buy from. If you buy from some vendors, the hardware may be less reliable. I'm not going to name names. If you buy from other vendors like Emacs or Radio Master that have a pretty good track record, I think they're going to be relatively reliable. Uh, but that's that's a question some people would ask. The other thing that makes Express LRS stand out is that it is actively being developed. Now that may be a negative for some people. They may go, I don't I don't want something. I want it to just stay the same forever. Great, Crossfire is great for you. <laughs> Crossfire hasn't. I mean, it, it hasn't gotten a significant feature update in I can't remember how long. Not that they have stopped developing it, but the development that they've done have been things like bug fixes and very small features. It doesn't feel like a project that is in active, like it's not hot, right? It's like the difference between the first two months when you met the love of your life and 10 years after you got married, right? Express LRS is still in that hot phase and maybe it'll stay there forever. I mean, eventually, you know, projects kind of fizzle out. Who knows how that'll go, but Crossfire is very much is like slowed down, in my opinion. Well, it's not just my opinion. You could just look at the firmware updates and see how many updates there have been. I think it now, was like two years without a new firmware, and then we got one like two months ago, right? Or a month ago, something like that. So I mean, yeah. I I just updated my Crossfire module on my Tango, so I don't I couldn't say I was looking at that firmware list recently. And I, it was like bug fix, bug fix, tiny little feature. The last major they feature feature they added was AES encryption, which like that's not for average hobbyists. That's clearly for people who are in extremely hostile environments. And then before that, I don't know what the last feature they added was. So Crossfire, it, it, it may speed up. Like there was that live stream that Trappy did a while back where he talked about how he almost lost the company and there was a sense when that live stream came out that, you know, TBS has kind of been sleeping in a way because we were having this internal strife. But now the internal strife is done and we will regain our old glory. And who knows, maybe that'll happen. But for now, the main reason to move away from Express LRS, if the cost of the hardware isn't an issue, is just that you want to be a part of this uh, firmware that's doing cool things. Like, for example... I'll name one. Uh, Mavlink support. Crossfire supports Mavlink. But, and I don't know the details here because, like, I'm, I'm just, I, I acknowledge that I'm missing some of the details. Like, 
the the baud rate is so slow that it's not really usable. There, are, I don't remember the detail, but there are ways in which Crossfire's Mavlink support is actually not that usable, and people who try to use it find out that it's they they are like, oh, okay, we it, technically it ticks the box, but it's, I'm not actually using it. Express LRS is adding is working on the ability to have like a full Mavlink control link over the Express LRS link. Oh, that's really cool. And when they do it, I'm going to guess it'll actually freaking work. And if it doesn't work, they'll fix it. Well, that's the kind of thing that would move you to Express LRS. But for a lot of people, it's just like, no, I don't care. I just want my shit to work. And Crossfire is a great solution for that. Okay. I think we said plenty about that question. Let's move on. Am I still a Rotor Riot cast member? Yes. Except I haven't appeared in an episode in a long time. Um, uh, because every time they say, uh, will you, uh, Hey, basically the way it works is that they, there's a, Ro a rotor riot group, a Facebook group, and they'll say, Hey, we're filming on these dates. Who wants to come? And if I was like me, I want to come. They would be like, cool. They'd arrange my flights. They'd fly me out there. We'd appear in episodes. It'd all be wonderful. I haven't done that in a while. Um, I have had other opportunities that I've been working on. Uh, you know, every so often I go away for two weeks or maybe sometimes longer, and I do a, a private uh, a, a private uh, consulting agreement is how I like to put it. Someone says, Bardwell, I need you. The bat signal goes up into the sky, except it's the Bardwell signal. And then I send them an invoice and they pay the invoice and then I disappear for two weeks and do things. Uh, and that has actually ramped up in the last year to the point where every time Rotorite is like, hey, we've got we're going to do another episode. Uh, who wants to come? Either I've got a conflict. And as uh, as much as I enjoy filming with Rotorite and I really do, it's. I never did Rotorite episodes for the money. I always did it just because I like hanging out with them and filming and flying and doing cool shit. It was basically like a paid vacation, except it wasn't that much of a paid vacation because, like, ultimately they 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 pay for your time, but uh, the amount that other people are willing to pay is significantly higher. Not to say that they're not paying. I'm just saying. There have been there have been other opportunities that I've been taking, and I haven't appeared in an episode in a while. Uh, so um, that's I haven't I am a cast member, but I haven't appeared in an episode in a long time. That I still uh, consider those guys friends, and still, if the, you know the schedules worked out or if the opportunity was right, would go film with them. I probably will at some point in the future. I still do live streams for Quad Crew, which is their little membership program. Once a month, I do a live stream for Quad Crew and stay in the loop. But uh, I am a cast member, but haven't appeared in episodes in a while. How about that? Mm. Mm. Take a vacation. Well, well, take a vacation. I'm not a vacation kind of person. I, uh, I don't know. Like, every so often I take an actual vacation, but very rarely. Um, like, I don't know if I just have a, this mindset where, like, I'm, I'm constantly worried that at any moment, like, there was a long time where I made five to seven videos a week for my YouTube channel. I've since slowed down a little bit because no one can keep up that pace and, and make quality content. And part of the reason I, I made that many videos is because I just was worried that if I slowed down, things would drop off and I wouldn't, I would sort of lose my career. So there's this uh, sort of underlying sort of sense of anxiety. Um, so like, could I say, oh, I'm not going to take this work and instead I'm going to go film with Rotor Riot as a vacation. Yeah. But then, like, 
there's a customer going, hey, we'll pay your day rate and we'll hire you for two weeks. And actually, we'll pay you more than your day rate. And you're like, well, that's not going to last forever. Maybe I should just take this opportunity. I don't know. I actually, Blunty, I, you know, it's, I'm just sort of rambling now, but uh, I actually have a lot of uh, respect for your attitude. Uh, and I'm not trying to, like, put you on the spotlight, but I've seen lots of opportunities where you have gone, well, I've, I've gone like, hey, you could make some money if you did X. And you've gone, I don't want to. And then, like, I'll get a Steam notification. It's Blunty is playing X. And uh, it seems like you really got it figured out, dude. In terms of just deciding to do what you want with your life and not just sort of chasing the freaking bag. I don't know. Yeah, I I chased the bag for 10 years and uh, got enough of the bag to realize I don't care about the bag. Is what I would say. Like, I, I just can't. I can't care enough to work my life away doing anything. You yeah. Know? Like, yeah. I, uh, I know that everybody's not as privileged as I am, but... Uh, I found a way to do it so that I do not have to work uh, for a living. And I mean, you, uh, you're working right now. You know, We're both working right now. But right I mean, I, I don't, don't like have to spend like... a 40 somewhere, you know? Like, yeah. yeah. Um, and before that, you know, I was on call for eight years, 24-7, 365. Mm -hmm. Straight. You know, like you running wanna... a, a multi-million dollar it, yeah, business. Yeah, okay. Yeah. So People like, don't realize, I, well, a lot of people yeah. who watch the stream do realize, but people don't realize you yeah. were... In, in the traditional sort of capitalist sense, you were wildly successful. Yes. It, yeah. it worked out very well, especially uh -huh. not going to college and just, mm -hmm. just working by, my, you know, pull yourself up by the bootstraps is literally exactly what I did. Uh, and uh, I don't know. It just, I just very quickly realized like, oh, I get bored of everything. <laughs> it's not just that like I get bored of some things and I need to find the thing I don't get bored of. It's like, oh, I don't. I don't like working, which, okay, yeah. great. Everybody finds that out. But, like, I, I just made opportunities to make it so that I didn't have to do the 40 um, and then bailed the heck out of that. It, so, it, it's yeah. it's interesting to me. It's almost confusing because, like, if you were if you were a guy who sit, sat around in his basement all day and, you know, smoked weed and played video games, I'd be like, okay, I mean, if that's what you want to do with your life, fine, you know, whatever. But that's different in my mind to a guy who made it to the height that you made it running a multi-million dollar business. And presumably you were making good money at that, right? I don't know. I don't want to pry. And then you went, nah, I'm good. And you walked away from it because like you had the option and you chose not to have it as opposed to somebody who never had the option. And so it wasn't an active choice. And I, that's really interesting to me. I don't know. Yeah, yeah I – uh, I had never really, I don't know. It's just what you do, right? You just work up and you make more money and you make more money and you try to figure it out. Right. And like, obviously that, and that's what I did. Mm -hmm. And yeah, it, I, I got to a point where I was going to say like, Oh, I need to ask for more money. And then I thought in my head, well, how much money do I need to ask for? Right. And then I was like, Oh, there's not a number. I just right. don't want to do this anymore. Right. Right. But, like, yeah. yeah. So then it was like, oh, well, let's figure out how not to do this because I don't actually care about money. And if you're like one of those people who needs a nice car or has a fa wants a family, right? Mm -hmm. They're like, I don't, <laughs> there's things that I want or don't want, right? Like, right. I don't want to have a kid. I don't have a kid that I already have to pay for. Like, I don't right. have a girlfriend that I'm paying for right now. Like, and that's not something I'm getting into soon. You know what I mean? Like, I just. Like, there are things you have and priorities, and based around my priorities and the way I like to live, uh, it's very easy for me to move to Alabama, make basically way less money, and not have a, not have a huge problem. So. Yeah, yeah. I, uh, my, my wife has a – we were talking to a friend of ours, and, and they were like, oh, there's this thing that uh, somebody wants me to do, but I don't really want to do it. It was a, a job-related thing. I don't really want to do it. But like if the, they were to offer me the right amount of money, I guess I'd do it. But I don't know how, like, I don't know what that number is. And my wife says, okay, here's the thing. Would you do it for a dollar? No. Would you do it for a hundred dollars? No. Would you do it for a thousand dollars? No. Would you do it for $5,000? Yeah, maybe. She's like, okay, $10,000 is your number. She said, find the first number where you go, ah, I might do it and double it. And then that's your number. 
was like, "Ooh, that's pretty good." I don't know. Yeah. If you're if you're driven by money. <laughs> um but uh but me, I, I tell you, uh me like on my days off, like I I I just always I always want to be doing something. Right? Like I'm I'm going to wake up on my day off and then I'm going to go out and I'm going to like start freaking doing something in the yard. I'm going to start a project. I always want to feel like I'm doing something. And I don't know if that's just like how I'm wired or if it's like some kind of like, it, like I need to learn how to relax, but I can't. But like, you know, so as long as I'm going to be doing something, I'm if I have the opportunity to do something that someone's going to pay me for, then I'll take it. And, you know, if it's interesting and I kind of, anyway. Yeah, I mean, philosophy. I like... I help people troubleshoot drones all day. You know, you do yeah. too. You know what I mean? Like that's, I don't, I don't care about working. I just care mm -hmm. about working on my schedule, doing the things yeah. I want to do, progressing the things I want to do and being able to stop when I want. Right. Like yeah. if I don't feel like coming in today, I just answer you tomorrow. Right. It's not right. a big deal. Yeah. And like, no, I'm not ruining half a business's workflow and I'm not like, you know, there's so many pieces to missing a day of work at a job you actually matter for, you know? Yeah. So. Yeah. All right. Well, let's uh, let's move on. Let's see if we've got any super chats that have come in, and we'll start. We'll start again. Don't I see you have a shitload of questions pinned, Blunty? Before we move on, are there any of those pinned questions that relate to our discussion that we should grab right now? Uh, oh, not necessarily so this discussion. You've got so many pinned questions, but I feel like it's time to do the super chats. We're like forty minutes into the stream, so I can't even freaking see, <laughs> Blunty. I can't see. Hang on, I have to make this full screen. Um, so here's what we're going to do. Sorry it took us so long to get to the Super Chats, people who left Super Chats. Uh, we got a little into a discussion. And uh, we're going to read Super Chats until we run out of Super Chats. Uh, here's 420 for the Trogdor reference on the New Year's episode. Yes, consummate Vs. Ah, uh, Trogdor. Ah, uh, strong bad. Scott Besson, thank you for a $5 Super Chat. Can you power an external device like an action camera from the balance lead? Yes, 100% you can. The worry is that some older uh, plugs would pull power just from the first cell or just from the first and second cell because they needed a lower voltage. If you're using something like the iFlight uh, plug, it doesn't do that. And even if it did, it would slightly unbalance the cells. But unless you're doing like a 20 or 30 minute flight, the difference is not that big a deal and it's not really worth worrying about. So yes, the short answer is you can. Gardaroto, good to see you again. Thank you for a $5 super chat. Opinions on the 5-inch 1950 KV motors for success. Leave it or motor output limit in beta flight? Um, so 1950 KV on 6S is... A little high for six inch props, but the real issue, in my opinion, is that a five inch motor is going to have a smaller stator volume and therefore it's not going to have enough torque to really accelerate that prop as aggressively as you would want. And as a result, you're going to see a lot of an increased current flow, increased current draw. Um, I think it's going to be fine. I think it's going to be fine. I'm not even sure I would motor output limit unless I really cared about flight time. Like it would be better. It would be easier to pid tune if you had like a 25 millimeter or a 28 millimeter motor. 28 would even be too big, frankly. But like a 25, 26 millimeter motor, maybe even a 2407. I would say for a six inch prop, like 2407 is the bottom of where I'd want to be. And then we get up to like a 2506 or 2508 or something like that. And that's like kind of around the top. By the time you get to a 28 millimeter, that's overkill. That's, I think, the sweet spot for a six inch prop. But if you've got a 2207 1950 KV and you feel like slapping a six inch prop on it, I think it'll be fine. And if you really care, do like an 85% throw motor output limit and bring that KV down. Um, continuing on. Uh, let's see. $10 super chat from In Inyaki D. I'm not sure I said your name right, but hopefully I said it close to right. I just brought a, f I just bought a Foxier N10Q, but it takes four minutes to lock sats. I isolate from the frame of the video transmitter and it locks faster, but still is shitty. What else can I try? Um, to be honest with you, I would buy a different GPS, a whole different brand. 
Now, I'm not saying, and I don't want anybody to say that I said that there's a problem with the Foxier N10Q, right? But if I bought a GPS and it was having such bad performance, even though I took steps to mitigate it, the first thing I would do is I would just spend 20 bucks on a different GPS and like see what happened. Like, I don't know if the Fox series is the problem or if I just got a bad GPS, but I just wouldn't take a chance wasting my money. Like, what do you care if it's the Fox Ear GPS? You don't care. You just want your GPS to work and you bought the Fox Ear. So like, just pick a different brand. I would buy the Flywoo. Pick the Flywoo. Buy the Flywoo M10. See if it works better. And then if they're both shitty, then you know that something's up with your build. But for 20 bucks and a couple days shipping, you could just buy a different GPS and try it out. I guess you'll, annoyingly, you'll probably have to change the plug. That's, that's annoying. Run Puppy, thank you for a $5 super chat. I need some help with a project, but I think we need to have an email. Here's some thanks in advance. Run Puppy, thank you for your donation. I will not associate this super chat with your email. So if you actually want me to pay extra attention to you because you gave me money, you're going to need to remind me that you left me a super chat. Um, I have to say, the, 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 the emails that I answer the quickest and the easiest are the ones where someone asks me a technical question that I know the answer to. And I can just be like, cool, I helped you today. Thank you for the opportunity to help you. The emails that I am most likely to go, oh, I don't know. And then just sort of put them on the back burner and potentially never look at them again are invitations to appear at events, <laughs> invitations to come on your podcast. Uh, and I've got a project that I think you'd be interested in. I'm just being straight with you here. So if you send me and you're like, hey, I've got a cool project and I think you'd be interested in it. Chances are you're going to need to remind me that you left me a super chat. Otherwise, there's a fair chance that I'll go, oh, I don't know. Uh, yeah. See, here's the thing. Most of the time, if you think you've got a really cool thing that no one has ever thought of before and you're really passionate about it, you're, you, other people aren't that interested in it. Like somebody says, hey, I've been working on a stand-up set. Do you want to hear it? Oh, God. This is going to be so awkward. So, maybe, maybe, yeah. All, what I'm saying is remind me that you left me this super chat. And I'll be like, oh, okay, cool. I'll read your email and pay more attention to it. <laughs> um. Smudge202, thank you for a 10 pound super chat. Do you have a recommended three and a half inch drone with an O3? And is there a point to owning a three and a half if you have a five inch? Um, if you, the, the main advantage of a three and a half inch drone is that you can get it under 250 grams if that limit matters to you. And it still flies pretty freaking good. It doesn't fly exactly like a five inch, but pretty freaking good. And you stay under that 250 gram limit. Uh, recommended three and a half inch with O3. Well, does the Crux 3.5, we just spent the beginning part of this live stream rizzing up the Crux 3.5. Does it come with the O3? I'm not really sure it does. Analog. I don't know. Well, Race Day Quads doesn't have it. ELRS, HD0. That's not the O3, though. That's the uh, Vista. Well, damn. What about the uh, iFlight AOS 3.5? That comes with the... Uh, that's a good one. It's a little more expensive. I don't think that's under 250 grams. Uh, does the AOS 3.5... F you. Does the AOS 3.5 Evo... Uh, first of all, is it even still available? Second of all, does it come in under 250 grams? I'm not convinced it does. Uh, Joltex says it is under 250 grams. Uh, oh, oh, 03. What about the Emacs Baby Hawk? Oh, 03. 
There you go. Uh, that's pretty. Emacs has a good track record with their baby hawks. Uh, okay. He's looking for a bind and fly super deluxe. He's not. I don't think he's looking for a DIY. I think he's looking for a bind and fly. Am I wrong about that? I think he's look. I got the feeling he was like. He didn't say bind and fly. I got the feeling he was looking for a bind and fly. I mean, if you're DIYing, you can build whatever you want. All right, we're going to go with the Baby Hawk 03. Any Cinewhoops under $250 worth using with the GoPro Bone? Thank you for a $2. Uh, Lincoln Shorts. Um, so if I was looking for a Cinewhoop under $250, my first thought is Darwin FPV. Darwin FPV makes reasonable quality, extremely inexpensive stuff. Uh, their Cine Apes 2.5 is under $200. In the analog version, oh, F you. Well, I, if you want to stay under 250 bucks, man, analog is basically your only option. Um... And I can't vouch for this Cinewhoop specifically, but uh, in your price range of under 250 bucks, there's very few choices. Okay. Um, Matt Norton, thanks for a $5 super chat. I've watched videos and I'm still confused. My Whoop has ELRS V2, but Beta 4.4 SPI receiver transmitter has 3.3 ELRS. Will it bind? If your Whoop has ELRS V2, then it will not bind to 3.3. There but is if, no build of 4.4 with V2 ELRS. That's, it's only V3. That's, that's what I was going to say. Yes, agree. If your Whoop has an SPI receiver and Betaflight 4.4, it does not have ELRS V2. That's not possible. I mean, theoretically, someone could compile it, but they didn't. So either you don't have an SPI receiver, you don't have Betaflight 4.4, or you don't have ELRS V2, one of the two, one of the three. Okay. Thank you, Toxic Red. Do you think Walksdale will ever catch up to DJI? Thanks for a $2 super chat. Um, short answer, no. Longer answer, no. Okay, I love that joke. I'm sorry. Um, no one will catch up to DJI. DJI has, like, no one. Who, who has ever caught up to DJI, right? Like, you could argue that there are things about DJI you don't like. Anti-competitive business practices, ties to the Chinese government, etc. You could argue those things. I'm not arguing those things. That would be silly for me to take that stance here on a live stream. Uh, there's no reason for me to like make political statements and put myself in the <laughs> freaking firing line. But you, one thing you can't say about DJI is that their tech is like not the best. DJI's tech is the best. They make amazing drones that do things that no one else does at price that is shocking. And they just keep innovating every six months, every 18 months, every 12 months, whatever it is. They just keep innovating with new stuff. So no, no, Walksnail will not catch up to DJI. No one will catch up to DJI. But here's the thing. No one will catch up to DJI at the things that DJI does. We got a little bit of a, like a Sun Tzu situation here, right? I don't know the exact Sun Tzu quote that applies, but basically if DJI is good at, is, is the best at these things, then for Walksnail to like catch up or beat them, they have to do the things that DJI doesn't do or is bad at. And the things DJI is good at is making a video system that is freaking bananas good. They've had years of practice. They have billions of dollars in revenue. No one's going to beat them. No one's going to make a better video system than them. Like I'm just saying. Uh, 
If they do, it'll be shocking. But what Walksnail can do and is doing is making products that DJI will not make. Right? The 1S video transmitter. DJI didn't make that. Full support for DJI, for, for Betaflight OSD. DJI did that eventually. Still doesn't support iNav or RGPilot though. There's all these ways in which Walksnail is making products that DJI doesn't or won't make. And that's so. The, so to me, the way, the way I see Walksnail is Walksnail makes an FPV video system that like if DJI is like S tier, Walksnail is like B tier, maybe B plus tier, maybe A tier. I don't know. Somewhere between B and A. That's still pretty good, right? I don't think Walksnail will ever be S tier. And if they are, DJI will redefine what S tier is so that Walksnail is still A tier or B tier. But Walksnail does a whole bunch of things and makes a whole bunch of products that DJI will never make. And so that's why they're still a competitor and still viable and still uh, I'm glad that they're here in the in the market for us. Just so that it's said, uh, yeah. also, Walks DJI... From what we know, DJI works with lead core or a company making lead core style chips to make the chips that they get produced for them, basically. Yep. Walksnail is buying an off the shelf, technically, chip from a company yep. called Artisan. Mm -hmm. So uh, there's a level of things they can demand, slash, do, slash, whatever. You know, when we see new chips come out, uh, like the 20 kilometer thing we're hearing, that's just a label that's on the new Artisan chip that it can right. do out of the box, right? right. So. We're sort of getting a, a dev kit solution that they're tacking into something they're making for us. So right. I don't think you can ever expect that secondhand thing right. to be as good as DJI's direct to consumer thing with their billion dollar Absolutely. drones already building Absolutely. that into it. Absolutely. You know? Yeah, when I say that, I don't mean that that's like a defect. I don't mean that Walksnail is like bad at what they do. I'm just saying that like if I were to start if I were to start an F1 team and be like, I'm going to make F1 cars. I, I don't have the resources to compete with Ferrari or McLaren. Like, I don't. I'm never going to make an F1 car as good as a Ferrari or a McLaren. And in the same way, Blunty, what you're saying, like, DJI, if they, they, they're not fighting fair. They're not fighting on equal ground. They have billions of dollars in revenue. They have sales numbers that no one can touch. And so then they go and they say they don't go and they buy an off the shelf system on a chip and then they adapt it. They go and they make their own and no one else can do that because no one else has the money and sales numbers to justify that. And that's why they're going to be S tier. They're going to continue to redefine what S tier is while everybody else plays catch up with the crumbs that fall off their table. But. That doesn't mean that uh, th that no one else is competitive. And just yeah. one more thing, since we're on it, that yeah. you know, when we when we think about like HD zero and how HD zero made a gap in the market, that's because Carl made a custom chip. <laughs> you know, yeah. that, that's another custom solution that was built for the application. When yeah. you're not doing that, I'm I respect Walksnail so much for what they're able to do with an off-the-shelf chip that they were able 100%. to make a deal for to get yeah. into a system to then build like they are. I think it's actually really incredible what we've got, yeah. you know, and uh, I think it bodes well for the future. I just think you have to look at that perspective of like HG Zero has their own custom thing to get the lowest latency and to get what they're doing. Mm -hmm. DJI has their own custom thing because they have billions of dollars of drones that they can build all that money through, and that would never happen if it was FPV only. Yep. And then Walksnail is just making it happen, even yep. without both of those. No. In, in in some ways, what Walksnail has done is more impressive because of how close they've gotten. Like, before Walksnail, everybody else who tried to do it was, like, C or D tier at best. The fact that Walksnail got to, like, A slash B tier with the, the resources and hardware they have is, like, extraordinary. So. All right. Um, Quad City Bay Area, thank you for a five dollar super chat. What's your opinion on digital FPV? Will keep upgrading. Is there a ceiling? Uh, I don't think we've hit the ceiling yet. I think that we will continue to make advancements. Uh, we know that the next generation is already on deck, and people are claiming five, four to five times the range of current systems. 
Uh, reality, of course, will never measure up to that, but I don't think we've hit the ceiling yet. And um, I don't know when we will hit the ceiling. I mean, what we like, look at Wi Fi. Well, why is that a good analogy? At the end of the day, digital FPV systems are just wireless digital data systems that move video data through the air, right? If you look at Wi Fi, Wi Fi has continued to get faster and faster. Although, in the last couple iterations of Wi-Fi, they've had to do things like go to six gigahertz or go to different frequency bands to get the the higher uh, data rates that they require, right? So in some ways, Wi-Fi is kind of leveling off. Technically, Wi-Fi 6 can do like, I don't know, I think it's like 1.3 gigabits per second. But in reality, most people using Wi-Fi 6 won't get that data rate. They'll get a lower data rate. And it's not that much different than like the previous iterations of Wi-Fi. So we see that Wi-Fi has achieved extraordinary things, but also they're pushing the ceiling, but the actual real world experience isn't climbing that much. I think we have room for uh, digital FPV to continue to push the ceiling. Eventually we may hit a ceiling. I don't think we're there yet though. Chewy Fahaka asks, can you use a different binding phrase on the external module and internal module so I can fly my drones and my sons? Thank you for five euros. Yes, 100% you can do that. 100%. Um, there's other ways to go about this, but that would absolutely work. And it's just have two models, one with the internal module, one with the external module. Right? That's how I would do it. Because you don't want any ambiguity about which model is active. Then just switch models based on which module you want to use. Crease asks, who is Flyfish RC? They came out of nowhere. I don't know. Good question. Thanks for $2. I have no idea. <laughs> Thank you, Matt, for seven Canadian dollars. I just ordered a baby ape, one of the best upgrades, and ELRS receiver. Also, Banggood has a big sale. What should I get? Uh, the receiver for the baby ape, I would get a Radio Master RP2 or a Happy Model EP2 or any other receiver with a ceramic antenna. On the baby ape, I don't think it's like going to go super far. I don't think you're going to be too worried about range. And that ceramic antenna is going to be super easy to mount. As far as upgrades go, I mean, the advantage of the baby ape is like how inexpensive it is. So as soon as you start upgrading it, like you're, you're, you're losing the main thing it brings to the table, right? The number one thing I'd upgrade on the Baby Ape, if I did upgrade, would be the frame. The frame is a little bit flimsy. Um, the motors are also a little bit flimsy, but the inexpensive replacement motors is a selling point. So I wouldn't rush to upgrade the frame. It's not, like the whole thing isn't bad. You could consider getting a better camera depending on which, which version of, the, of it you got. I think the cameras, like you should absolutely get the pro camera if you didn't. Um, yeah. Doug McLeod, thank you for a $5 super chat. I would love to see a video explaining all the FPV companies, what they make and their history. Man, like the thing is, most of these companies, their history is that some Chinese guy started a new company <laughs> and like... Uh, I say that because like we see these companies come out of nowhere and like half the time the guy who started the company or the group who started the company, they also own another group and they just decided they were going to make a new company. And I don't really understand the whole Chinese business culture. Um, it, it feels to me like there is less like like TBS, somebody like Trappy starts a company, they build a reputation and they stick by it. And, and they want to like establish that name and stay with it. And they're not just making a random new company, but it feels like in Chinese business culture, there is more of a tendency to just be like, yeah, we start a new company. We don't really care. And maybe you didn't even stop your old company, right? You just decided it was a good idea to do that. No, that's just my impression. I don't know if the, there's any truth to that, but like a history of companies like Flywoo, like I, 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 who knows? I don't know. The bottom line is that you look at the products that they make today and are they good products and do you want to own them? And so like, and, and that's an ongoing thing. Thank you, Thomas Rodriguez. Thank you for a $2 super chat. Any thoughts on 10 inch long range versus seven and four? 
Well, asking about 10 inch long range, probably you're asking about 10 inch long range because of the release of the iFlight Helion. I'm going to say Helion. Uh, you know, for the longest time, seven inch has been the de facto standard for long range. It's been the sweet spot where you get the efficiency of larger props, but you're not like using just a ridiculously big battery in props. Then iFlight released the Helion 10 and it made me, uh, you know, I ask why, why they do this? Um, because you can get 30, 40 minute flights on a seven inch, maybe longer. So what's the point of a 10 inch? Well, maybe you want even longer flights. The main thing a 10 inch gives you is, is larger cargo capacity. So you can carry a larger battery. Um, I think relatively few people are pushing seven inches to the limits of their capacity. And I'm not sure, like, obviously some people are going to look at this and go, yes, 10, 10 bigger than seven. Me like, right? Sure. I get that. Uh, but on some level, I'm not sure who this is for. Uh, Brandon Bean says it can use the same battery packs as your Cine lifter. So that's a bonus. Uh, maybe though, like maybe people are going to go, oh, 10 inches is so much better than seven. How did we not fly 10 inches all this time? I don't know. Remains to be seen. Uh, four inch is a whole different ball game. Four inch long range. You've got like a 3000 milliamp hour lithium ion pack. <laughs> and you're flying, you are flying for 30 or 35 minutes, but it's a much smaller aircraft. It's going to be much more affected by the wind and have way less cargo capacity. If you wanted to carry things like a camera. Uh, versatile. Thank you for a five dollar super chat. What size Cinewhoop to mount a GoPro to fly indoors? Thanks for two. Thanks for another two dollars. Uh, versatile. Um, for flying indoors. So I did an indoor Cinewhoop fly through with a three inch, or maybe it was a three and a half inch. I think it was a three inch, and I had a lot of problems with wind, especially like in a narrow hallway. I was getting bounced around a lot. And the problem was that all the air that my props were blowing was bouncing off the walls and was bobbling me around. And people said, if you were flying a two inch or a two and a half inch, you wouldn't have that problem. Some people said that for indoor flights, you want the smallest drone you can get. Not because you're going to be flying through tiny gaps, but because the smaller props move less air and you get more stable flight. And I was like, oh, I would not have anticipated that. So if you want to put a full size GoPro, I, I like, I think a two and a half inch Cinewhoop would fly with a full size GoPro, but not for very long. And a two inch, I, I, I wouldn't put a full size GoPro on a two inch for a full size GoPro. I think three or three and a half inches are ideal, but that's not ideal for indoors. So the actual answer to your question, and I say this as someone who doesn't do like a ton of indoor Cinewhoop flying, but just as so, like someone who kind of like tries to pay attention and have my ear to the ground. I think for indoor flying, a two inch or a two and a half inch with a naked GoPro is what most of the pros would use. And that brings us to the end of the Super Chats, at least for now. We have cleared out the Super Chats. We're going to go back to answering regular old questions from people who didn't pay any money. Um, Gadget RC asks, did you ever experiment with 3D printer nozzle bore sizes? Any benefit to printing larger than 0 0.4 millimeters? Yeah, so Gadget RC, I have not experimented with this, but I have been watching a lot of videos about this and thinking about it. If you need fine details, then a small nozzle is what you want. But a lot of people who print larger objects don't need those fine details. And going up to the larger nozzle significantly uh, decreases your print time. 
Um, there are new features in Slicers. I can't remember the name of the feature. Crap. There's a new feature in the Slicers that basically adjusts the line width as you're printing. So you can actually get equivalent detail to a 0.4 nozzle out of a 0.6 nozzle. And some people are making the argument that you should go to 0 0.6 and, or even larger if you, you know, and you're not actually giving anything up. Someone in the chat is going to remember the name of the feature I'm thinking about. It just came out. It's Arachne mode. Yes. Thank you, chat. Uh, originally, I think it came out in Prusa Slicer. What does Arachne mode do? I think it adjusts the line width. Arachne perimeter generator. It produces perimeter loops and gap fills with varying extrusion width. I was right. It makes per, it makes perimeters wider or thinner based on the detail that you're trying to create. And it basically gives you more detail. It gives you more detail. And so people have said, if you're using Arachne mode, then you can go from a 0 0.4 to a 0 0.6 and you don't really lose anything in terms of detail. Or you can stay at a 0 0.4 and get more detail. You know, that's up to you. Uh, I have not personally switched from a 0 0.4 to a 0 0.6. Um, maybe, so maybe when it's time for me to change the nozzle on my bamboo, I will think about switching to a 0 0.6. Most of the parts that I print don't have extremely small details. And I probably could get away with a 0 0.6 with no problem. But the, the bamboo already prints so damn fast <laughs> that I'm like, and, and my philosophy has always been, if you have a quadcopter that flies good, don't change it. If you have a 3d printer that prints good, don't change it. And I'm sticking by it. Thank you, uh, Donzi Freak, for joining my Patreon. Appreciate that. Uh, I'm using a very basic beta FPV goggle and getting ready to invest in a better goggle. I know my question may be beating a dead horse, but I'm not sure what protocol I want to use. I was considering buying HD0, so I have flexibility. Do you still believe it's a good option for a newbie? Um, HD0, obviously, it's the right choice if you're running HD0. If you choose to run walk snail with the standalone receiver, there is almost no reduction in performance when using the walk snail standalone receiver with the HD0 goggles. A tiny amount of additional latency, not zero. And if you're very latency sensitive, then you should just get the walk snail goggles rather than using a standalone receiver. But probably an acceptable performance for most people. As far as analog goes, here's the thing. I've used the HD0 goggles as my primary analog goggles for the last, I don't know, since they came out. I just switched to them and never looked back. And for those who say, what does that mean? Bardwell mostly flies digital. That's true. I do. But going back to like when someone puts the bat signal in the sky and says, Bardwell, I need you. And I go and I, I teach a class or I do a consulting agreement. Um, for a long, uh, for a lot of the time, those were analog. Um, and so I would go and I would spend two weeks, uh, on a flight line with, you know, four, or four, or eight people in the air at a time, not eight, but like three or four people, three or four people in the air at a time had no issues with my HD zero analog performance, zero issues. But I hear from racers. And some racers are just switching away from their HD0 goggles. They're just like, it's no good. Because there's some issue with the performance of the HD0 goggles when used with an analog adapter in a high-density environment like a race. They get black screen and rolling screen and other issues. And I have to acknowledge that even though I haven't personally experienced it. And say that if you're like a racer and you're serious about analog... I've seen other racers rejecting the HD zero goggles because of these issues. I still feel like the HD zero goggles are the best all around. Even today. Let's see here. Let's see here. Um, 
Morgan Tien, I just got my first sponsor. Anything I can do to go above and beyond to impress and build a better relationship? Ooh, that's interesting. Um, I have mixed feelings about this one. Yeah, Blanche, go ahead. I have one quick thing I want to say. That's, yeah. You shouldn't be worrying about that. Like, that's my two cents. Go like, ahead. your relationship with the company is not the important thing. Like, I don't know. Like, why do you have yeah. the sponsorship? That's the question I would start to ask yourself, right? Like, like what is the at. role of the sponsorship? What am I doing with the products? Why, you know? And then think about, like, what are you doing to service the, the people who are viewing you or the people who are at the races you're at or whatever the sponsorship is for? And then sort of decide based on that, right? So, like, yeah. you're not here for the, like, I don't know what your sponsorship is like. Some sponsorships are only, like, 30% discount or or whatever on products. But, like, even if it's free, like, you're not necessarily entitled to, like, treat them well or do better. You should be representing the product as the product, even with a sponsor, right? Yeah. And find ways to do that properly. That's sort of what I would yeah. say. That's a, that's a really good point. Um, like, I understand the impulse it is it is professional and it is ethical that when someone compensates you for something that you live up to that right it is the right impulse to say i want to foster a good relationship with someone who has hired me and i want to deliver a high quality of work for them and i want to ensure that they're happy right that is a good impulse that is that is like hopefully that will lead to success in life but you have to remember that your number one priority is your relationship with your viewers or whatever whatever kind of content you're creating whoever consumes your content um you got a goose that laid the golden egg situation here it's really tempting and i say this from personal experience to focus a lot on the company or the person who is literally cutting you a check or who is sending you gear that is a concrete thing that is happening right now that is good for you and you go oh i got to keep this guy happy and it's easy to forget about your relationship with your viewers because that's like there's so many of them and like you get little comments from them but like it's very, it's very sort of um, abstract. And the thing is that if you sell out your viewers for the sake of a sponsorship, you will lose your viewers, right? And so you gotta, you gotta keep that. And I, plenty, I think that's the direction you're going. Is that right? Yeah, that's generally what I'm saying. I think your your primary goal should be the relationship with your audience the relationship with the places you go the races that you're at whatever whatever reason you're sponsored right right like the relationship should be with the people you're advertising to with the product that you're getting yep. right because yep. obviously you're not getting product because they like you i mean maybe that's the case but like typically no. there's an ulterior motive right you're a company obviously. spending money on product so that you can advertise that product in some way right so it's important to not necessarily consider the really you shouldn't be attempting to preserve the relationship at the loss of any other part of the situation exactly exactly so like if somebody sends you a product obviously what they want from you is that you're going to promote that product you're going to do a video about it you're going to do posts about it in your feed they want you to put that product in front of people's eyes and then if you actually have an audience that trusts your opinion which some people just have an audience and they're like, just please post about this, put it in front of eyes. But if you have an audience that actually trusts your opinion, then they want you to say good things about the product and recommend it. And so like, that's the relationship you've got. And if they send you the product and you just like, don't post about it and you don't do anything and you're like, yeah, meh. Well then like they're pro they're potentially not going to give you more product, but is that the worst thing that could have happened? Because if they send you the product and it's a piece of shit and you hate it, like there's a there's a tendency, I think, especially at the beginning, to feel insecure and to go, I can't do that. I can't just shit on this product. Because you, you, like you just got your first little nibble on the line. And now you're just going to like pfft, 
throw it back. But like your your integrity is so much more important. Um, like what do people v come to you for? Why do people view your content? Why do you have an audience? And probably you don't have an audience because you shilled for bad products. Okay. I've seen cases where the audience was willing to forgive shilling for bad products and just go, yeah, yeah, yeah. They, it's because they like the content so much. So maybe there's a way to kind of have it both ways. Personally, I don't feel great about that. What you can do to go above and beyond, though, is without selling out your audience or compromising your integrity, you can make sure to like you, you want they want you to make content about the product. You can do it in a timely manner. It don't take three months to make a video. Don't accept product and then be like, eh, I'm not that interested in this. And then not make a video about it like a freaking prima donna. If you have 300,000 or more subscribers, you can you can get away with that. But uh, it's definitely unprofessional. <laughs> I'm talking about myself. I have I have I have real struggles with my own sort of mental health where I'll I'll a, a vendor will be like, "Hey, we've got this new product. Do you want to review it?" and I'll be like, mm. And they'll be like, "Hey, we got this other product. Do you want to review it?" I'll be like, mm. "And they'll be like, "Look, we got this. They'll just keep and I'll be like, "Okay, fine. Send me the I, I don't know. Yeah, that looks interesting. Send it to me." And then it'll come and I'll be like, "I don't want to review this today. I'll go do something else." Like it's a constant struggle to be like and I know people who have real jobs who every day they go in and they do things they don't want to do. Be like, oh, whine about your mental health some more. But like, I'm just like, uh, you know, it's, I have to try to find that balance. And sometimes I'm like, oh my God, I got this product four months ago and I still haven't reviewed it. And basically I just acknowledge that I'm never going to review it. I'm sorry. And then I don't review it. And then hopefully I review the next one. And I'm just like, you know, mm. This is what it is. It's unprofessional as fuck. And uh, the companies deserve better. But you know who deserves better? My audience. That's it. That's the thing. My priority is, number one, myself. My own well-being and mental health. Because if I burn myself out and quit because I just can't take it anymore, then I haven't done anybody any favors, including my family, who needs income to survive. And... Then my audience, number two, without whom I wouldn't be here. And then like a distant third is the vendor who sent me a product, which let's face it, they sent me a drone and it cost them $200. It's like just freaking a rounding error in their marketing budget. And sometimes I don't review that product. Sorry, but I'm going to take care of myself and my audience first and the vendors a distant third. And if that means they don't want to send me any more product, that's okay too. Anyway, um, okay, moving on. Uh, Monks asks, I have about 30 hours in liftoff with about 15 to 20 hours being on an Xbox controller. Now I just need to buy batteries and a charger. Do you recommend I spend more time in the simulator or get flying? Um, I would say if you have 30 hours in liftoff and some of that with a real controller, you are okay to go fly a real drone probably it just depends like in liftoff can you take off fly down the street turn around come back and like be basically in control so what i recommend you do is you take your real drone somewhere like a big wide open field like a soccer field or you know a meadow a pasture right some place where there's just nothing to crash into and try flying it be aware that the, the power of the real quad, the gravity is going to feel different. Like, don't just, like, peg it. Like, in liftoff, if you can just, like, be like, Pew! don't do that with the real drone. Take it slow. Just get a feel for it. But probably you're okay. Um, 
let's see here. Ooh, this is an interesting one. Blown Stuff FPV. I have both the V1 DJI goggles and the goggles too. For better reception doing mid or long range, you think I should use my old V1 goggle with a good patch and Omnis or update the firmware and use the goggles too instead. So you've got a Vista video transmitter, I infer. Otherwise, this wouldn't, because the Vista doesn't work with the V1. I mean, the O3 doesn't work with the V1. Um... I think you're going to get better range with a good set of patch circular. I assume you've got circular polarized antennas on the aircraft because that's usually what the Vista has. I think you're going to get better range with a circular polarized patch on the V V1 goggle than upgrading the firmware to the G2. Two reasons for that. The first one is that some, and Blunty, you brought this up in the comments. I saw you talking about this on the Discord server. Some people think that the Oath that the Vista doesn't get as good range on the G2 goggles as it does on the V2 goggles, that it doesn't go to full power with the with the new firmware. Also, the Vista will have circular antennas, but the G2 will have linear antennas. You could solve that by putting linear antennas on the Vista, though. But I think um, I think in general you'll probably get a little bit better range with with good patch antennas on the V1s than by going to the G2s. Ooh, here's a good question from the Discord. Hoda released two new versions of the, of the F6, the Plus and the Pro. Can you break down the differences? Uh, yeah, absolutely. Oh, well, well I don't want to just steal Oscar Leong's content. So I clicked the first link that came up. But I feel like if I just read Oscar Leung's article, that would be cheating. And so I'm going to not do that, but I wouldn't want anyone to think I had anything against Oscar Leung by clicking away from his page. I just want to like form my own opinions. So here's the Hoda F6 Plus and the Hoda F6 Pro. Is race day quads not? No, race day quads. Hoda F6 Pro. There we go. We'll do the race day quads for both of them. Hello. Go. Go. Um, F6 Plus, 1,000 watts, 60 amps. F6 Pro, 720 watts, 60 amps. F6 Pro, uh, both of them quad channel. Both of them AC, DC, so they, they can plug into the wall. F6 Pro, 250 bucks. F6 Plus, 185 bucks. So the F6 Plus is 25% more wattage. No, 250 more watts. And $70 cheaper, $75 cheaper, $65. I am bad at math. Uh, is this just like an older one? Let's keep looking at the features. XT90 input. 250 watts times four at 15 amps per channel. Doesn't say here. Let's look at the specs. Hello, specs. Specs, there we go, sort of. God forbid we get consistent specs. 15 amps max charge current times four. DC 250 watts times four. DC 180 watts times four. AC, oh, here's a difference. Okay, so the F S F6 Plus has, has a smaller AC power supply. The F6 Plus only does 500 watts when you plug it into the wall. The F6 Pro does 720 watts. The F6 Pro does its full wattage. 180 times 4 is 720. Okay, that's the main difference. The F6 Pro does its full 720 watts when powered off the wall. The F6 Plus 
has to have an external DC power supply to get up to 1,000 watts. It only does 500 watts when it's powered off the wall. So that's the main difference. I suspect the other specs are very similar. Yeah, the other specs are very similar. Okay, so the question is, number one, do you need more than 500 watts of output power? If you're fine with 500 watts of output power, which is frankly quite a lot, then buy the F6 Plus. If you need more than 500 watts of output power, do you already own an external power supply, like a thousand watt power supply, like I have, you can't see it because I'm on the wrong camera, but if you have an external power supply that can go to a thousand watts, then again, buy the F6 Plus. However, if you want the convenience of just plugging it into the wall without having to take an external power supply with you, or if you need 720 watts coming by plugging it into the wall without an external power supply, then you're going to pay extra for the F6 Pro. That's the answer. Um... So, for example, the F6 Pro would make a great travel charger. Not in, it's freaking enormous and it's freaking heavy. I don't mean that. Like, I don't think you would throw it in your backpack, right? But if you're going to go on like a, a flight, if you're going to go on a trip and you're going to chuck a charger into your, into your bag, like your check bag, and you want to get where you're going, you get to the Airbnb and just boop, boop, plug it into the wall. You got 720 watts with the F6 Pro. You're only going to get 500 watts with the F6 Plus. However, most people are going to be fine with 500 watts. Unless you're charging big Cinelifter batteries or things like that, the F6 Plus is significantly less expensive and will do the job for most people. There you go. Oh, that's a good one. That was a good question. Super Deluxe has a great question. Is Crossfire Protocol so good that ELRS can't come up with a better one? Or is it just easier to stand on the shoulders of giants? Here's the thing, Super Deluxe. Um, I, I don't know the details of the Crossfire Protocol, all the ins and outs. I don't know. Could the ELRS devs come up with something better if they started from scratch? I'm going to say probably, only because... Crossfire hasn't like been actively developed in a long time. At least that's my impression. So probably there are optimizations that the ELRS devs could come up with that would be better. I don't know. Like what are the chances that there's just no way they could improve it, right? But the problem, like look at what happened with Immersion RC Ghost. Immersion RC released the Ghost video transmit, or uh, sorry, the Ghost receivers, the Ghost, and Betaflight added support for Ghost. And now Ghost is, a lot of racers still run Ghost, but Ghost didn't reach like widespread mass adoption. And the Betaflight devs now have this protocol that's baked into their code. It's taken up space. Well, with the cloud build functionality, it's no longer taking up space. So I guess that's nice. But there's, there's, maintenance costs to having new protocols added to the code, right? There's, there's new bugs to find, new quirks, need to update the code when the protocol changes, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So I think what we have here is a case where Crossfire is more than good enough and it's widely supported. We're not just talking about beta flight. ArduPilot supports Crossfire. INAV supports Crossfire. So let's say the ExpressLRS devs were like, we're going to make a new protocol. And by the way, I want to be really clear. ExpressLRS doesn't use Crossfire over the air. ExpressLRS is not just a copy-paste of Crossfire. And that's why it runs faster than Crossfire. Over the air, ExpressLRS is its own unique, distinct air protocol that is like improved on Crossfire in a lot of ways. But when the signal gets to the receiver and the receiver has to send it to the flight controller or when the module needs to get signal from the radio, they use Crossfire for that because everything already supports Crossfire 
and it's good enough. And so if they release their own protocol, they would have to get that baked into Edge TX. They'd have to get that baked into Betaflight, RG Pilot, INAV, everything. It's not worth it. It's a case where the standard that exists is good enough and the cost of moving to a new standard is not worth it. Right? Exactly. Thank you, Plenty. We're going to finally have a meme that, but it's not really a meme, that, uh, that Blunty posted. <laughs> exactly. There's always an XKCD for any situation. You got it. Um, Super Slow wants to know, how long till we see AI being used in FPV? I don't know. Can we just stop AIing everything? Like, can we stop just acting? How long before AI makes me a hamburger? I don't want, no. Shut up. I would like a person to make me a hamburger. To make me a good hamburger. We don't need to apply AI to every goddamn situation. How long until AI is used in FPV? I mean, like, what do you even, what do you even mean by that? What is AI? Is AI machine learning? I mean, there have been uh, 3D printed quadcopter frames developed with machine, with iterative, g g g uh, what, iterative design where a computer slowly sort of slices away parts of the frame in an organic way to decide which parts of the material need to stay and which parts can be removed without compromising strength. Is that AI? Oh, no, that's not AI. That's machine learning. Well, what is AI? Well, uh, all I know is I saw this article about ChatGPT. Okay, I'm being a little a little uh, insulting. Like, people people are like, well, AI. ChatGPT, Chat AI. AI. Midjourney. AI. AI. Midjourney does really cool things with AI. ChatGPT does really cool things with AI. Why don't we just make everything AI? It's like, well, yeah. So, like, could AI analyze black box data? Yeah, actually. Um, there was a project. Uh, Drone Mesh was working on it. Uh, I don't think he was working on it. He was like, he did content about this guy who did his PhD project, you, you know, using AI to develop a flight controller. It didn't have a PID loop. It was flown by AI. Um, the thing is, like, AI is a tool. So first of all, AI isn't a thing. AI is not a thing. Artificial intelligence is a catch-all marketing phrase. So when you say, is AI, is, is, is it AI? What does that mean? Do you mean machine learning? Do you mean, uh, you know, uh, genetic algorithms? Do you mean neural nets? Do you, what do you mean by AI? Okay. If you can't answer that question, like then you should, you should be able to. But then AI is just a tool. It's just a tool to solve certain types of problems. And uh, it's, you know, it's not currently being used. Like, do some of the beta flight devs use a, uh, a language model code generator to generate some of the code that they use? Maybe. Maybe AI is being used right now to write the code. I don't know. Yeah. Anyway, thank you for the opportunity to rant about the fascination with AI and the sort of vague impression that all problems are best solved with AI. When will artificial intelligence change the oil in my car? Because I don't think that Jiffy Lube's doing as good a job as they could. And I feel like if we just had some AI, we could change the oil in my car more efficiently. No? Okay. Um, anyway, 
How about we do it on super chats? Plenty. We got some. We got a couple more super chats. Let me get a couple more super chats. Uh, and we'll go back to the normal, the normal chats. Quad City Bay Area. Thank you for a ten dollars super chat. Is analog VD Digi same when example at 200, 700 milliwatts? Quad City Bay. Area, what the hell? Did you have a stroke in the middle of writing this question? I have no idea what you're asking. Blunty, do you have any idea? Can you parse this for me? Yeah, is analog video uh, the same as digital when you compare them at the same power level? I think that's what it is. No, digital is better. Digital, I feel like digital has at the same power level, you know, Apple's. By the way, first of all, a digital at 700 milliwatts is not at the same power level. Can we can we just get that out of the way real quick? Chris Rosser discovered that when an analog video transmitter is operating at 700 milliwatts, the video transmitter is outputting 700 milliwatts, and that is being fed into an antenna, which is further increasing or focusing the output power. So the, the, the analog video trans, whereas the digital video transmitters, for whatever reason, their output power is after the antenna. So the analog video transmitter has about 2 dBi advantage, 2 dB gain advantage compared to the video. The digital video transmitter is coming into the race with one hand behind its back. It's operating at a lower output power level, even though technically they both say they're operating at 700 milliwatts. It's not an apples to apples comparison. I'm not even sure why. Why would the dig? Maybe part of the reason is that the digital video transmitters, they're like, God, if we said, if we told everybody we were operating at 250 milliwatts, they'd lose their mind. We have to say we're operating at higher power levels or no one will buy our products. I don't know the answer. DJI figured out how to beat the game. And with the O3, they just don't tell you what its output power is. Ha ha ha. Can't complain about the output power if you don't know what the output power is. Mm. Um, but so it, even if you said that they were apples to apples on par, digital is still winning because it's actually using less power. Um. But I think that even set like 700 milliwatts to 700 milliwatts, I think that digital maintains the usable image longer. That's my opinion. Um, Brandon Fannin asks, thank you for $10, Brandon Fannin. One of my five inch quads is a Vista air unit. I have it paired with the Integra goggles. I have been unable to get the OSD elements to display. Uh, Brandon, first of all, thank you for your $10 donation. This is the kind of question that is going to require some back and forth. My short answer would be that you should load the DJI O3 preset from the Betaflip presets tab and make sure you select the correct UART. My longer answer is that you should email me, jb at joshuabardwell.com, and we'll go back and forth and try and figure it out. Because I'm going to ask you, like, can I see, you know, what flight controller do you have? Where do the wires go? Let me see your ports tab. And we're not going to, we shouldn't do that on the live stream. It'll be, it would just be too slow and, just, and unwieldy. Um, <laughs> uh, Smudge, I had the same experience. Uh, somebody built a large language model based on FPV content. I assume that they ripped the transcripts of a bunch of my videos and some Oscar Leong website. And I don't know what else they did. I just I'm, I assume that's where they got their content. And they posted on Reddit some questions that they asked the model and the answers it gave. And the answers were wrong. <laughs> I mean, sometimes the answers were so generic that they weren't wrong, which is a thing that large language models do. But then like one of the answers said, one of the questions was, what are some good spangy rates? And it said, to get spang rates, go into Betaflight and put these, it said, it gave an answer to the question that seemed really, you know, really right. But the instructions that it gave said to set the rates type to actual, but the rates that it gave were Betaflight rates. So the actual rates you would end up with would be wildly wrong, maybe potentially unflyable. Because when you put beta flight rates into actual rates, you get ridiculously high rates. I've done it by accident sometimes. And I was like, and, and, and to his credit, the developer of the model was like, yeah, no, we know it's got room for improvement. I'm going to keep making it better. But I guess the thing is with these large language models is they, when they give you a wrong answer, they give you a, a wrong answer just as confidently as a right answer. 
and they have no idea that it's wrong and neither do you. So they can be useful, but they're far from perfect. Michael Hill, thank you for a $10 super chat. Any certain ELRS receiver that you recommend? I bought the Radio Master Pocket and I'm going to build with the LRS this time. Is the EP1 still a good choice? Um, Michael, I like, like the Happy Model EP1 is a fine choice. It's a good receiver. These days I'm buying the Radio Master receivers if I can get them because in general I think they are pretty good quality. So the Radio Master RP1 or RP2 would be my choice. But if you want to get the Happy Model, that's fine too. They're also not bad. Um, thank you, Bro Wild, for a $2 super chat. Appreciate your uh, encouragement. Good to see you again. What's the deal with left-hand polarized antennas on HDVTXs? Why not right? Thank you for $5, James Thomas. James, I don't know the answer. Like, D the DJI V1 system came with left-hand polarized antennas when most analog people used right. Uh, like, I could guess that DJI did it to reduce interference. That it was a good neighbor thing to do. Because if DJI is left-hand polarized and analog's right-hand polarized, they're going to be slightly less likely to interfere with each other. I don't know the real answer because I wasn't in the room and nobody's ever said. DJI started the trend and everybody followed along is the short version. Okay. All right, well, we got about 15 more minutes in the stream. We'll take some more questions here. Um, can I use the Bandit module Bluetooth to connect telemetry feed to my laptop or Android phone? I've done this on TBS on several flights, and it works. I am not aware that that is possible. Captain Bry! Captain Bry! I w I'm now going to punish you for showing up for my live stream by asking you ELRS questions because I know you're an ELRS dev and I see that you're in the chat. Captain Bry, can they can can express ELRS module output telemetry or whatever via Bluetooth? Captain Bry says we have a pull request for it. That means that it doesn't do it today, but it will do it soon. There we go. Thank you, Captain Bry. Your range test with the MT-12, what receiver were you using? Um, it was the Radio Master 5 channel with the X. It was the ER-5C, I think. ER-5C with the external antenna. Um, asking what the telemetry power is, some people caught on to the fact that I got telemetry lost, and they said, yeah, but telemetry lost doesn't mean you fail-safed. And that's true. You can lose telemetry and not fail-safe. But I fail-safed. I assure you I fail saved. And I think what happened is I drove the car and it kind of went over a hill and the hill just cut cut the link. That's my guess. Um So for whatever reason I lost fail safe and control link at the same time. Like I could tell when I was pulling the trigger that the car wasn't driving. Like I, like it wasn't like I just heard the words telemetry lost and went, okay, I guess that's it. Like the car wasn't driving. Shorty FPV says, after building the Vanny Style Pro, I realized I'm up to something like 10 freestyle quads. What's a good number to have? Uh, 10 is too many. Like, I'm not trying to tell you your business, but you ask. For me, if I had 10 quads that were all in good shape and flyable, I would either I would do something super risky and kill some of them or I would like give or sell them, give away or sell them to somebody. Like I just I hate having a whole bunch of quads that I never fly. Like I say that with like 10 quads on the wall behind me, 1 2 3 4 5 6 12 15 quads on the wall behind me. Some of those quads are like they're 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 holding a spot for a specific situation. So even though I don't fly them every day, it's like, that's my X drone. That's my long range drone, whatever. And I need to have those because like, this is my job. But like, I, I, if I had 10 five inch freestyle drones, I absolutely would not like that. And I would find a way to get rid of some of them. That's just me. Um, because like only three or four of them would I actually want to fly. And the others I'd be like, eh, I don't like this one. Uh, 
Alay FPV, Ale FPV. I'm switching from Crossfire to Express LR, so I do mostly freestyle. Which receiver? Uh, Radio Master RP1. Short answer. Right? Radio Master RP1. It's a Radio Master makes good quality hardware. The RP1. I don't think you need diversity for a freestyle quad, personally. I hate, I, I dislike having to mount two antennas, although I could come up with a 3D printed mount that made it easier. Uh, but I don't think a diversity receiver is really needed because freestyle, you generally aren't, aren't pushing the range that much. Um, but uh, I would take the RP1. Um, ooh. Ant BVTHC asks, why is the bottom of my drone getting extremely hot? The ESC isn't touching anything. Um, usually, Ant, if there is a hot spot on the carbon fiber frame, it means that your battery lead is short-circuiting to the, to the frame somehow. A common way that this happens is that when you're tightening down the standoffs, you pinch the battery lead with the standoff, and it cuts into the positive battery lead. It has to be the positive battery lead. And then that carbon fiber has just enough resistance that you don't get like a dead short from the battery, but you get a little bit of current flow that makes it heat up. So good on you for checking that the ESC isn't touching anything, but I think somewhere you've got a pinched wire and it's short circuiting feedback to the frame. That is my best guess. Sadly, the place where it gets hot is not the same as the place where the actual pinch is happening. It's going to get hot where the resistance is the highest. Um, let's see. Eric Stephanie wants to know if a radio master is going to come out with PWM receivers in 900 megahertz. I mean, it seems like they would, doesn't it? And like, it seems like they would. I hope they do. Um, because like for a ground vehicle, especially a crawler, you really don't need that ultra low latency. Um, and it seems like, can, can 900 megahertz do 100 full? Captain Bry, can 900 megahertz receivers do 100 full? That would be an issue if they couldn't. Because with PWM receivers, you want to be using one of the full modes. That requires FLRC. Does the 900 megahertz receiver do module do? Yes, it can do. Okay, Captain Bry confirms. Okay, so good to go there. So I'd be running 100 full. 100 full on 900 megahertz. I think that I think it's like seems like a no brainer that Radio Ma Master would do that. I say that. I, I want to be clear that I'm not like dropping hints of something I know. This is speculation, but like it seems like they would do that. And for it seems like people running cars would want to do that because if you've got a car, that 900 megahertz antenna, the size of that antenna is like completely negligible in a car. And the additional sort of range of 900 is really going to help when you're on the ground. Then again, how far do land, like most people aren't FPVing their ground vehicles and don't actually need that range. So there's that. Um, I got a speedy B F four Oh five mini 20 millimeter and the motor beeper function doesn't work. Is that something the stack can't do? Blunty, did you tag this question because you know there's a bug? Or did you just tag nope. it because you thought it was interesting? I figured you could explain how motor beeper function works. and yeah. yeah. So the motor beeper function will work with... Do you need bi-directional D-shot, Blunty? Or do you no. just need D-shot? You just need D-shot. We've been using motor beeper for yeah. years, right? I thought so, but I do. sometimes like you know, I'm old, so I forget. Um, Eddie, if you're able to use D shot, then motor beeper should work. Are you using D shot? I can't think also, of any legit reason why the motor just, beeper wouldn't work as long as you're using D shot. 
Yeah, just a remind if you don't happen to know this, right? Motor beeper doesn't work if your quad is armed because the motors correct. need to be still to make the beeps. Yeah, uh, correct. But otherwise, yeah, if you trigger that beeper function while you're not armed, but your drone is on, it should be beeping. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, so have you enabled the motor, the D-Shot motor beacon function in uh, the configuration tab? I mean, sure, the ESC needs to support it, but like any BLHeli-S or BLHeli-32 ESC will support it. There's no chance that, that like... Speedy be released an ESC that like specifically doesn't support the beeper. I mean, I guess that's like not impossible, but it, do it doesn't make any sense. So, um, Jack FPV wants to know what would you recommend for analog goggles with DVR? What a great opportunity to uh, plug my website, fpvknowitall.com. And if we go to the ultimate FPV shopping list, analog FPV systems, no wait, it's goggles. Is it here? Analog goggles, yes. Analog FPV systems, analog goggles. The Eosheen EV800D or the Eosheen EV800DM are my choice for the best budget goggles. That's what I recommend. Um, yeah. Mm -hmm. Let's see here. Got two more super chats. I don't know if you want to. Oh, let's make sure we get those. We don't want to finish the stream without with outstanding super chats. Thank you, uh, James Thomas, for a ten dollars super chat. I was gifted a fractal wingman three inch, and it's a one S eighteen six fifty. They recommend twelve oh two point five eleven thousand kV, but I'm thinking two S. How are you gonna put a two 18650 cells on the fractal wingman three inch like is that a thing how are you even going to do that am i am i like chat am i missing something is there a 2s mod for the fractal wingman okay um so let's just presume that somehow you're going to shoehorn a second 18650 cell onto this. Right? Um, no, I don't think it's a good idea. Because now you've... In, like, these 18650 quads are so sensitive to weight to begin with because the 18650 battery is pretty heavy. Like, I just think this is a terrible idea. I think that this kind of build is extremely tightly engineered. Could you get two 18350s? Oh, that that math works, doesn't it? You're going to take two 18350s and put them in place of an 18650. I mean, okay. I mean, I th I guess that higher voltage is probably going to help. Like, I do think that they, I, th I think it's worth a try. I think it's worth a try. I just don't know what kind of performance you're going to get from those 18350 cells in series. But I think it's worth a try. Um, as far as motors go, um, hmm, if they recommend 11,000 kV, then nominally, if you double the voltage, you go to 6,000 kV. But generally, when you go to higher voltage, you also go to higher kV. And that's one of the things, one of the advantages you get by going to the higher voltage. So I might be shooting for maybe 8,000 kV just off the top of my head. Uh, yeah. 18350 for short runs, 1S for cruising. I mean, that's that's possible. You're going to need a um a larger uh flight controller too cuz you're going to most of the really small ones are 1S only. If I go to my sub my shopping list fpvknowitall.com 
fpvknowitall.com. I've also got a sub 250 gram page. And there's some flight controllers and ESCs on here. Now these are standard 20. Hmm. These are standard 20 millimeter ones. As far as AIOs go, we've got the Gepar CF411, the fly, uh, it's not a 1S, is it? Why are we not linking? What the, what the F? What the F? Honestly. Honestly. First of all, why are we not linking Get it, GetRC on this? We have a GetRC affiliate. Okay, that's probably my mistake. But also, what the f is this? It's like no one. It's like no one proofreads this content before they hit go. I'm sorry. Anyway, Flywoo Goku GN 745, GetRC F 411. I don't know if those will exactly work, but. That's my suggestion for a 25 millimeter AIO. Okay. I'd be interested to hear what your results are. Uh, we got 100 rupees here from Bharat Parsia, who says, INF seems to be a great firmware, but there are far fewer videos on YouTube compared to Betaflight. I haven't tried it yet. Tempted. Freaking do it. So many flight controllers these days can run both Betaflight and iNav. Save your Betaflight configuration and flash iNav and give it a try, right? Absolutely. Highly encourage. I want to try iNav 7. Put it on one of these 7 inches here. It's iNav 7, right? So we put it on a 7 inch. Yeah, it makes sense. Um, all right, folks. It is 9.59. Blunty, we all caught up on Super Chats? We are. We are. Um, if you didn't get your question answered, please feel free to email me. JB at JoshuaBardwell.com is my email address. I do my best to answer all the questions that I get. Um, and uh, so, uh, you know, you don't have to be a patron. You don't have to super chat me. Obviously, I appreciate it if you do. And I give a slightly higher priority to people who are paying me money. Seems only fair. But I do uh, go through my inbox every day and uh, and answer uh, as many of the, almost all of the questions. Sometimes questions get pushed off to the net la next day, like people asking me to be on their podcast or trying to tell me about this great new idea they have. Uh, go earlier in the stream if you want to know what I'm talking about there. <laughs> uh, for technical questions, though, I try to answer very promptly. Uh, so, uh, crap, we just got a new super chat. Um, how do I set up analog VTX to work in beta flight with the Speedy B F7? Thank you for five pounds. Uh, the short answer is you need to go to the presets tab and load the VTX table for that video transmitter. Long answer is I'll be happy to work through it with you. Uh, but the live stream is ending and it's going to require some back and forth in email. So you should email me with this question and I will, uh, get back to you. Okay. All righty, folks. We are out of here. Blunty, thank you so much. See you tomorrow for the news. Oh, the, and Siati. Uh... Have a great stream. Siati is streaming. Go watch Siati stream next. He's going to dissect. He's going to dissect somebody. Ah, oh, that seems like a recipe for demonetization, Siati, but you do you. Have a great stream, Siati. Bye, everybody.